Welcome once again to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program where we take an intergenerational approach to the book of Revelation. To my far left is Guillerme Borda, who's a doctoral student in New Testament at Andrews University. And uh, next to him is Gustavo Assis, who is a doctoral student in Old Testament at Boston College. Uh, right next to me is Iris Mamier, who is a professor of nursing at Loma Linda University. And that's my institution too, but I'm a professor of religion. So we're in here talking about Revelation 17. I invite you to take your Bibles, go to Revelation chapter 17, one of the most difficult passages in all the Bible. So difficult that the biblical writer gives us a call for special wisdom in verse 9. Would you read that for us, Iris? Absolutely. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Mm -hmm. mm, so there's a mind calling for wisdom. Uh, it seems to me that's a really important concept in the Old Testament, Gustavo. You were, you were hoping to get something on that in, and yeah. here's your chance. All right, so wisdom, and not only the word wisdom, but seven heads, mountains, and then later on we have horns and so on. Uh -huh. That is one place in the Old Testament that all these ideas are put together, mm. which is in the book of Daniel. Uh -huh. Daniel is, I'll not say obsessed, but that is a word, the idea of wisdom and understanding appears throughout the book of Daniel, everywhere in that book. Um, and so, for example, chapter 1, you have the king of Babylon sending messengers to Jerusalem to find young boys who were knowledgeable mm -hmm. to be taught in the, in the royal courts of Babylon. And, but, it, I mean, the language of wisdom shows up. He was up looking for a room full of wise guys. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. That's, that's the reason. And also is like to acculturate them mm -hmm. in, the, in the society. So the uh -huh. Russians did that with the elite of Afghanistan, educated them in uh, Russia, in Moscow, sent them back to Afghanistan. So it was part mm -hmm. of that idea that Nebuchadnezzar is doing. Uh, but there is one incident, which is chapter 2. The king has a dream. He doesn't know what he dreamed. He is inviting his specialists, all sorts of specialists that he had available at his royal court. And no one is able to do that, to remind him of the dream and to give the interpretation until Daniel shows up uh, in the story. And so Daniel chapter 2, uh, we have here the verse 20, 20 yes. Uh, 220 of Daniel, Daniel uh, says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. And now he starts listing characteristics of God. He changes times and seasons, removes kings and sets up, sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So what we get from this text is that wisdom is with God and he gives to those who are seeking it. And uh, for me, the, the surprise uh, of Daniel, uh, this whole, I mean, every chapter has a language of wisdom and, and understanding here, is that Daniel is not among the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. In the canon of the Jews, the list of sacred books of the Jews, Daniel is not among Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12 minor prophets. It is in the neighborhood of other books of the Bible that, you know, we don't read as prophetic. Mm -hmm. So, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, yeah. Psalms, mm -hmm. Proverbs. Mm -hmm. And Proverbs has a lot to talk about mm -hmm. wisdom, mm -hmm. right? So, I was talking to Iris uh, about that earlier. Like, the first nine... Chapters of Proverbs are full of wisdom. So, mm -hmm. and you had a passage that you that you had in mind. Yeah, I I thought immediately of Proverbs three, verse five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, which is basically an invitation to come into an intimate relationship with God. Yes. So maybe contrary to the way the Greeks would see. Mm -hmm. Sophia, or the sophists, you know, where it's all about rationality yes. and reasoning and, you know, 
It is really the invitation to trust in the Lord and to lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. And I thought Daniel is just such a beautiful, amazing example of that kind of a way to do life. And as a result, he is the only one who served under three consecutive kings. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. You know, typically the old guard is executed, right? Mm -hmm. And But he, his wisdom was appreciated. Mm -hmm. it, it was outstanding. And it was very much tied to the kind of God that he believed in, in, in whom he trusted. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Since that's distinguished here, how, how would you... How would you... I think I that? can know things in, intellectually, but when I don't know how to apply it to my life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. knowledge may not help me. Mm -hmm. I may know that drugs are bad for me, but unless I can restrain myself and live according good. to that insight. Very good illustration. So you, you can know drugs are bad, but it may not impact your behavior. Mm -hmm. Applying that knowledge in practical ways is important. And I think it's telling us in chapter 17 this is not an intellectual puzzle. Mm -hmm. the, the really important things here will require God's wisdom, which means a heart that's open to, to mm -hmm. God and to the leading of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? yes. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the whole idea of knowledge and wisdom, uh, a, a clear example, in my mind at least, is to see the minutes of board meetings of Protestant theologians in 19th century and early 20th century Germany. And those Protestant preachers and theologians, uh, I mean, ex excellent in their examination of scriptures. They knew what they were doing, uh, but the anti-Semitism was vicious. I mean, mm -hmm. it was so mm -hmm. strong. And you wonder, how come someone, I was I used the, the New Testament person, uh, Kittel, Kittel, the, Kittel. Yeah, the, the theological dictionary of the mm -hmm. New Testament, vicious anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. and yet produce a fantastic piece of scholarship about the Bible. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? And I think it is the difference of knowledge and wisdom. Wow, wow, that's really, that's really helpful. Um, well, let's apply that wisdom. Let's go to verse 10. Yes. <laughs> in, in verse 10, well, first of all, just noticing verse 9 of chapter 17, where it says the seven hills are... Seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And obviously, it's hard to visualize that picture of a woman sitting on seven hills and then sitting on seven heads. You know, just a, mentally, that's a, that's a challenging image. Um, but uh, this is the question that, that I have here. You have here seven kings in verse 10. All right, five are fallen. Mm -hmm. One is and the other has not yet come but when he comes he remains for a little while okay mm -hmm. so you have seven kings here come with me to verse 12 and it says there the ten horns you saw are ten kings <clears throat> so what's the relationship between the seven and the ten people have wondered about that well one difference that you see in the description is that for the ten, it says, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they received authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Mm -hmm. So these are kings or powers that will be in force at that time of the mm -hmm. picture here. And it says, um, it says here, for one hour as kings with the beast. And in contrast, in the description of the seven kings, it says, there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. So if they have fallen, they have already been kings before. Mm -hmm. So clearly at least these, fives, these five ones are not related mm -hmm. to those ten. And one is also different mm -hmm. from the ten. Mm -hmm. And then the other has not yet come. The question that would be is, is there a relationship between this one to come and these and the other ten. ones because yeah. they are also to come? But mm -hmm. clearly, 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 just from a surface yeah. reading, these first six are clearly different, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then it opens the possibility that the seventh one is also different. 
So the seven and the 10, ten are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the seven are consecutive. Uh, the ten come into existence for a short time and then they're gone. So it's just, it's an end time construct. Something about this end time picture of the woman and the beast will focus on these, uh, these ten horns. So I think as people interpret and look at that, you know, you got seven heads and ten heads, seven kings, ten, mm -hmm. you know what, uh, your mind begins to spin when mm -hmm. you see all of that. But here's the fun part. This is the part that gets everybody juices flowing if they're really <laughs> trying to solve Revelation 17. And that is verse 10, where it says that uh, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. Who are these guys? Well, before the identification of these guys, do you... Um, do you see these three parts of the description, the who have fallen, is and uh, will come? Do you see a correlation of that with the mm. the Was it? exactly? Yeah, that part of the mm -hmm. the description of the yeah. of the beast. That's the big challenge. Mm -hmm. If you see them as the same thing, then you have this problem that the middle one is in one case and is not in the other. Yeah. So it's like they can't be the same thing. Mm. I mean, every time you try to make them the same thing, you get twisted into a pretzel. <laughs> so uh, that's why I suggest that the way out of the conundrum is to see the was, is not, and yet is as a, as a devilish parody of the, of the mm. character and person of God mm. and identity of God, and uh, not so much concerned with a time sequence yes. uh, as, as the other. As you try to picture this yeah. beast, do you think it would make sense to see these ten horns all in that seventh head that is future as well? Because yeah. I would find it, I mean, because if these ten horns are future, you know, they, they have not received power yet, and these five heads, five of them have, are kings from the past, then maybe those ten horns are all in that one head that is also future? Okay, that's a, that's a good suggestion. But take a look at something else here in verse 11. It says, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth. Now my translation is ace king, but it, it isn't in the text. It's just he's an eighth. Yes. And he is, let's see, what does it say here? He's of the seven. He, he, is, he belongs to the seven. He belongs to the seven. And he is going to yeah. his destruction. Yeah. So in the Greek, it's simply, you know, some translations say he's one of the seven. Mm -hmm. And that leads people to say, well, which of the seven heads is this ace? But it's not, it's not connecting with that. He's of the ace. The ace is the beast as a whole. Mm -hmm. And here you have, here's where the thing breaks down again. It's like the heads no longer matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The heads played their part, but this is the end time beast, mm -hmm. and now it's the horns mm -hmm. that will matter. And uh, so in, in a sense, Daniel 7, you had a focus on the beast, then on the head, and, and then the you horns. focus on the horns, and, yeah. and it's as if the beast no longer matters. Yes. So it's something like that is happening here. But who is the five that have fallen, the one that is now and the one that is yet to come? That's the big question, the tough one. For me, the crucial element is the one is now, if that is John's day, I think things get much clearer. Mm -hmm. If that's John's day, then you've got to look for five powers previous to that mm -hmm. that came on the scene and then went off. Okay, so Egypt will be the first one that we have in the... I mean, the first one to punish the people or to enslave the people of Israel. The first major power yeah. in the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. yeah. And then there Enemy will be power. Assyria um, after the, the, in the divided monarchy after David and Solomon. Uh, and the kings, I mean, you destroy the city of Samaria, destroy the, the kingdom of Israel. And then you have Babylon, the mm -hmm. third one. Mm -hmm. My concern with, is Persia mm -hmm. because Persia... Um, I mean, the other three, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, they were, they were cruel 
to Israel, to the people of God. Persia, there is the incident in Nestor, but it is, let's say, the, the Persian king was tricked to sign the decree mm. to execute all the Jews. But typically, the Persians receive a very good press in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But it is one of the beasts in Daniel that come out of the sea, right? So. True, but not, not in a negative light, right? Not as, let's say, uh, one that will cause trouble to the people of God. But it was Maybe a world power. It and was a world power, yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying that out mm -hmm. of all the, all the group here, I think the, the least bad is Persia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cyrus, mm -hmm. the guy who uh, conquered age. Babylon and mm -hmm. signed the decree, sending yeah. everybody back to their homelands. Uh, but then Greece will be the following one, mm -hmm. and the whole debacle of uh, Antioch's Epiphanes and uh, uh, yeah, the Greeks were very harsh to to Jerusalem, to God's people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have Rome, which yeah. destroyed ways. Jerusalem uh, in the year seventy. So you have five there. So perhaps we have to say then that these seven heads are not necessarily hostile in and of themselves, but they are they are yeah. powers. That yeah. have dominated. With Rome, you get past. six, though. With Rome, you, you get to six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, that's well, have the but Rome would be the one that's now. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I mean, not not very uh, religious oriented, but it reminds yeah. me of the comment that you made about not bad in itself or toward yeah. the people of God reminded me of Monty Python. What did the Romans do for us? Yeah. Uh, that conversation. And mm -hmm. I mean, and they start listing a bunch of good things that the Romans did for the Judeans. Mm -hmm. And so, in let's say, a surface level, they were not that bad, uh, but eventually they showed their true colors. But what all these five have in common is that somewhere in the Old Testament, uh, they are, you know, they go off the scene. They are fallen. Yeah. You know, Egypt, uh, Ezekiel 29, mm -hmm. uh, Assyria, Nahum 3, mm -hmm. uh, Babylon, Jeremiah 50 and 51, mm -hmm. uh, Persia, Daniel 8 and Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. Greece, Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. So each of these five powers that you mentioned, there's a text in the Old Testament that says this is now off the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the key is not so much, you know, what was the persona that this power had in the Old mm -hmm. Testament, but that it dominated and then went off the scene. Yes. Yeah. So then the one that is now would be Rome. Rome, yeah. And then uh, the, the one that is yet to come, the seventh, uh, would be the beast from the sea mm -hmm. and, and all that that means, you know, the medieval church and things like that. But then comes an eighth. So in verse 11, it says, there is yet to come. There is an eighth. Mm -hmm. But before we get to the eighth, in verse 10 is a funny thing. And that verse 10 says... These are ten kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. Guillerme, that, you know, if you're talking about the whole Middle Ages as being that seventh head, that's not a little while. <laughs> so uh, how would you put those two, because I think you, you would agree with that idea, but how, what would you deal with this little while? Well, I'll put a tentative suggestion, mm. right? Uh, so if, if this series, and people have suggested different series, and if, if this series is correct of uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, uh, Middle Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, and then eventually um, Papal Rome, which then would tie Revelation 13, the sea beast, um, if this series is correct, the issue of the time, well, I would answer with a question. Jesus also says that he would come soon. <laughs> right? Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, hasn't come yet. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if we can um, understand uh, one, it might help us understand the other. Okay, so within Revelation itself, there's the concept of his coming is soon, and yet it's a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But even better than that, I think chapter 12, verse 12, the dragon comes down to earth knowing he has just Little a short time. time. Yes. yes, yes. But we know his coming to earth is 2,000 years ago. Mm. Yeah. 
So and the same book that talks yeah. about the short time is the one that yeah. talks about the 1260 mm. and the 42 months, all of that. So prophecy often collapses, mm. you know, a, a lot of things uh, into one sentence or, mm. or one mm -hmm. phrase uh, at different points. So, yeah. All right, so verse 11. Can you see why this is one of the toughest chapters of the Bible? I think we're making about as much progress as you can, but uh, there, there's many, many challenging things here. So it says, then the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth. The word king is a translator's assumption if you have that. He is of the seven and is going to destruction. So it doesn't say he's one of the seven. So a temptation a lot of people have is to say, well, is this Babylon? Mm -hmm. You know, the Babylon head? Is it the uh, Roman head? You mm -hmm. know, the, the, the Roman Empire? Is it the medieval church head? You know, which head is it? I think is the wrong question. He's of the seven in the sense that he's like them in character, mm -hmm. but he's not one of the seven. Mm -hmm. He's an eighth. Mm-hmm. So I think the eighth is the end time beast. Mm -hmm. It's the beast of chapter 17. As far as the time point of the prophecy is concerned, all the seven are already passed. Mm -hmm. But now we have an end time equivalent, and that's the woman riding the beast together, mm -hmm. is doing what these great powers used to do, dominating the world, uh, persecuting God's people, Etc. So, does that make sense? Um, well, I think from, let's say, a practical perspective here, everything that we read was already murky, difficult to, to follow. But let's say up until John Stein, or let's say the one uh, that has yet to come, uh, in verse 10, A, that's dividing the, the verse in, in, um, in two parts here. That is, let's say, present time, let, kind of contemporaneous to, to what we are, like uh, past history. 11 onwards, we are talking about the future, which makes it impossible to determine the true nature of the like the true meaning of the text, right? So before, like up until verse 10, mm -hmm. it is a little bit easy to grasp the, the reality, like mm -hmm. the, the, the sequence of events. In verse 11 onwards, we are dealing with uh, the future and it is very, um, I mean, we should not be naive to kind of mark down mm -hmm. all, the, all the details because it is still Needs to unfold. Even with prophecy, the future is not predictable. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake many people make. That, that if we only get the right interpretation, then we can predict everything that's coming. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to be what God intended. So many times in the Old Testament, when a prophecy is fulfilled, it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. You remember Isaiah 11, where it predicts four things about the Israel's return from Babylon. And one of these is that an east wind will blow over the river Euphrates and dry it up mm -hmm. so that they can walk across in their sandals. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what actually happened. Mm -hmm. The prophecy was fulfilled, but the details turned out differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that anyone who seeks to predict the future in detail, remember that book by Froome we talked about mm -hmm. last time, uh, 4,000 pages of attempts to predict the future based on prophecy, Mm -hmm. And most of them are laughable today. Mm -hmm. So a, a certain amount of caution, especially with ch chapter 17, mm -hmm. uh, would be advisable, I think. Mm -hmm. So coming back to something you said, uh, Guillerme, it seems to me that verses 8 to 11 kind of give us the pedigree of the beast, mm -hmm. don't they? And what's the biggest pedigree of the beast? Wouldn't it be chapter 13? Yes. You have a religious, political beast that's there. Yes. You have to understand chapter 17 in light of chapter 13. <laughs> what, what, you know, things that you see there, the mark of the beast, everything, all of that, of that conflict 
the mm-hmm. end time um, yeah. climactic moment of decision and taking sides, right? Mm-hmm. But the beast of chapter 13 is both religious and political. Mm-hmm. Here in chapter 17, the two are separated. So in the end time, there are two separate entities that together are everything that the sea beast was. Mm. That happens in chapter 13 too. Because the sea beast and the land beast create what? Mm, the image of the beast. The image of the beast, which is a, a new entity. The eighth, perhaps, mm-hmm. you know? A new entity at the end of time, a new unity dominating the world, persecuting God's people, etc. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, chapter 13 is kind of critical. It is very important indeed, right? Because, uh, I mean, just in chapter 16, just right before this, when you have in the sixth, uh, in, as we went to the bowls, and then they, they get more specific, and then there's the fifth one of the throne of the beast, and then the sixth one, there's the river phrase dried up, and we came to chapter 17 to try to understand those waters, and because mm-hmm. there's river Euphrates make, makes you think of Babylon, right? Um, but then what you find here in chapter 16 as well is that... Um, is, is that trio of the with that end time deception of these unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, beast, and the false prophet. Mm-hmm. You have that trio mm-hmm. that you have found in mm-hmm. chapter 13. So right That's here... the religious side of the sea beast is Babylon. Mm-hmm. And which is yeah. right here on the verge yeah. of coming to chapter 17. Uh-huh. You have this, this uh, moment that to understand, you go to chapter 13 to understand that. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the, you, you see the things uh, that happen here. So chapter 17, also I would suggest, you consider chapter 13 very seriously yeah. to understand it. And the mm-hmm. political side of the sea beast is the scarlet beast of chapter 17. Mm-hmm. So the two are united together. They're working together for a short time in chapter 17, but they are echoing the earlier beast uh, which would perhaps be the seventh head. So you see this, this eighth is not the seventh head, I think. It's clearly something after and something of a different character. But hearkening back to the image of the beast uh, in chapter 13, that there's an end time function of all the things that you've seen in the prophecy all the way through. Well, I'm feeling like we've had a few surprises this time. Mm-hmm. So... We'll hang in there and see you again next time on GPS.